I know lawyers traditionally are known for their reluctance to speak in public and <laughs> preference for using few words rather than many. I will bear that in mind. Like the previous speaker, I'm representing a British institution, but I'm not originally from Britain, of course, but I don't think that's a problem. I think in many ways it illustrates the, the key point that I want to, to emphasize today. There are a number of similarities and differences between the situation that legal education faces today and the situation that we've seen in business education. Clearly the world economic environment has not, um, well, it, it has affected the legal profession just as it's affected everyone else. Though traditionally lawyers didn't see themselves first and foremost as business people, they saw themselves as professionals working in a business environment. But some of the underlying changes which are occurring today in legal education can be traced back not to the relatively recent financial instability in the environment, but rather to a more fundamental difference or dichotomy, tension, between what the law schools regarded legal education was for and what the practicing lawyers wanted of new graduates. The other key distinction between business and law is that whereas an MBA may well be a qualification which can be used throughout the world and it is very much a universal qualification, legal education by its very nature is country specific to at least an extent. And that's the second point that I want to emphasize today. The way in which legal education is far more global than was traditionally the case. The changing legal environment. Traditionally, it was believed that once you graduated from law school, entered into a law firm as a, as a junior, worked your way up, became partner, spent your entire career in the one firm. For many people today, that is not the case, primarily because of the changing legal environment. So therefore, our graduates need to be much more deployable, much more flexible, much more able to be placed in a new environment without too much difficulty. They need transferable skills as well as legal knowledge. Over the last decade or so, there have been a few significant changes in the way in which legal education has been provided. There has always been an emphasis upon technical legal knowledge, and there's no doubt that one would expect a newly qualified, newly admitted lawyer whether practicing in the courts or in an office, to understand legal principles, legal rules, and to be able to give sound legal advice. But what has become increasingly apparent to the law schools and is increasingly incorporated into the way in which we teach is a recognition that pure legal knowledge is not alone sufficient. And a good illustration of this is a conversation I had recently with a senior barrister who was involved with interviewing candidates for pupillage. In the, the UK, of course, it's a divided profession between the barristers and the solicitors. And this barrister was saying something which was by no means new to me, but I think was important to emphasize. And it was simply this. When interviewing a candidate, they assumed that they had the requisite legal knowledge. They assumed that they were academically gifted and well qualified in that sense. But what they were looking for 
was not academic knowledge, but rather interpersonal skills, commitment, and signs that this was a rounded individual. Of course, what this illustrated to me was the, the contrast, the tension that had existed for hundreds of years between the law schools which traditionally emphasized black, what we call black letter law, the hard knowledge, but at the same time tried to make their graduates well-rounded, and the law firms which traditionally wanted simply that hard black letter law, the knowledge, and were concerned less with rounded individuals. The difference today, I think, is that the law schools and the profession are essentially talking along the same lines. It is not enough to have the pure knowledge, you need the skills as well. And I interviewed, I did a mock interview for a student a few weeks ago who had asked for assistance preparing for a scholarship interview at one of the Inns of Court in London. And I completely threw this student because I said to him, why would I want to invest in you? He was expecting an academic question, a legal question, and he couldn't cope. He floundered for about five minutes and he said, can I start again? And I said, well, of course you can, but remember you're not going to have a second chance in the real world. When he got underway, he actually did quite well. But what it illustrated to me was that with that student, perhaps we hadn't prepared him with the life skills that the law firms are actually looking for today. So there are half a dozen key skills that must be emphasised by law schools, by legal education, in legal education today. The first, of course, is the foundational competencies. In other words, the legal knowledge, the analytical skills. These always must come first. There's no question of that. But perhaps we need to emphasise more the, the team context in, such, in which such skills must be learnt, must be uh, manifested. Because a lawyer is not working on their own. The second key skill or attribute to emphasize, and again this echoes what we've just heard from the business environment, is communication. The ability to communicate in writing and verbally. I can give you two brief examples of that. My twin brother, also trained as a lawyer, but he, he adopted the practice of a solicitor. So he's a real lawyer, I'm only an academic lawyer. And he sent me a letter, he's practicing in New Zealand, he sent me a letter a little while ago, written by a moderately experienced solicitor. And he said, read this, what does it say? Of course, the reason he sent it to me was because it was effectively incoherent. It was written in English, it is true. But what it was actually saying was not by any means clear. That solicitor, as far as I'm concerned, is not someone I would want to hire. The second example of communication is a student I was talking to a little while ago who said that her ambition was to be, to be a criminal barrister. Fine, what do criminal barristers do? They stand up in court and they defend their client, often an indefensible position because the person clearly did it and everyone knows that, but they've got to do their best to get them off. Where was there a problem with the student? Academically they were qualified but she told me she doesn't like to speak in public. A problem, a serious problem. Of course, we have such things as mooting societies and debating societies which we get people involved in, 
But traditionally, these were never compulsory in legal education. Most universities today still do not make them compulsory. I think they are fundamentally important. Fundamentally important. And recently, I took part in an undergraduate mooting exercise. Every student, even those who are doing the criminology course, is required to do a moot. And I have to say, the standard was very good. So I was pleased on that front. The third key skill, which is absolutely indispensable, is quantitative abilities. Traditionally, if you were good at mathematics, you became an accountant. If you couldn't count, you became a lawyer. <laughs> a serious problem, because every lawyer has to make sure that they're actually making enough money to be you know, to satisfy their employer or to satisfy themselves. So they need to be able to understand a spreadsheet. They need to be able to understand what the actual finances are. I suppose it's a similar problem to your average, for your average academic. They don't really understand the financial basis of what they're doing. In my training in New Zealand, a significant proportion of those who are doing a law degree were also doing a commerce degree. So at least in that context, the majority had some knowledge of basic spreadsheets. But your average law graduate, at least uh, in the common law world, doesn't understand accounting, doesn't understand business. There is some discussion at the moment in Aberystwyth University of uh, administrative restructuring of the faculties in the different departments. And it looks probably the case that the Department of Law and Criminology will be working much more closely with the School of Management and Business. From my perspective, that's what we should have been doing all along. Because our graduates need to understand economics and accounting, just as they must understand law. The strategic understanding. A law graduate must have some understanding of the context in which they are working. Not just the economics of what they're doing. They need to understand the ramifications of any legal advice they give. You can achieve that by requiring them to do non-law subjects, or you can achieve that by incorporating a more strategic view into specific law modules. Or you can encourage undergraduates to experience a range of different activities, whether it's related specifically to their degree or not. Project management and leadership is another area that's vitally important to legal education. Because, of course, the legal profession, like any other, is an activity which requires some administrative ability and some leadership. Probably more so if you're going to be part of a large firm. But certainly you need to manage a